Good morning. Uh, here we go. Cha we're going to finish up chapter 18 today and uh, enolates and start chapter 19, acids. Here I, uh, I had a bee in the backyard and I was, uh, took a quick video of it uh, pollinating our lime tree. So I thought, thank you, Mr. Bee, for pollinating the lime, lime tree. And then I thought, hmm, Mr. Bee? How do I know it's a Mr. Bee? I think I thought it was a Mr. Bee because I was figuring queen bees, female, they're the ones with the hives, I guess. But what do I know? So I uh, looked it up. So I went to this web, I just Googled it, found this article, and it said female bees build, maintain, collect food and for and defend the nest, while the male bee primarily seeks mates. Sounds familiar, right, ladies? <laughs> and uh, both sexes drink nectar, but the females collect pollen uh, It serves as food for the young bees. So that sounds familiar too, huh, ladies? Just kidding. Uh, and the females, uh, forage at a greater rate because they got to get food for the babies. <clears throat> and uh, I had another big bumblebee in the back. It's cool. It's a. Uh, it was circling our kangaroo paws, and it seemed like it was trying to do like a pollen dance to get them to bloom because <laughs> they're not quite bloomed. And it just kept circling and circling and circling. Like, come on, open, open. It's pretty cool. Spring is in the air, huh? And uh, so, of course, I went down a rabbit hole. So. Uh, crops, they've done some estimates uh, that crop pollination by insects, it's, if, if you had to pay humans to do it, it would cost you about $14.6 billion just to, in the U.S. And this is a number from like 2012, I think. And uh, so it's an interesting thing. Some people thought the survey was a bad idea because then, uh, then they might be able to use it to justify destroying a wetland or something because you're like, oh, the, pro the money is not that much to, to our economy, you know, but it's an interesting concept. And then the most dramatic example of uh, how important the pollinators are is in China. This is from 2012. They had uh, problems with their apple and pear orchards not being pollinated because the bee population was so low from pesticides and smog and <laughs> lacking uh, wildflowers and things. So um, they, would they would pay people to self-pollinate, to human pollinate the apple orchards and the pear orchards. So they would have little bottles of pollen. You can see her little bottle of pollen. And then they would they would use a paintbrush or they take a chopstick with a like a feather tied onto it, dip it in the pollen, and then just pollinate the flowers of the trees by hand. And it was, seems kind of crazy, right? But it actually it was interesting. They said they had a higher yield of, of apples and pears because the human pollinator was more careful to make sure to get all the flowers where the bee is kind of more random. And I guess it just depends how many bees you got. Um, but, uh, but that didn't last very long because the Chinese economy got better and it was too expensive to pay workers. And I think they figured out how to get the bees back. So yeah, like in, in Europe and North America, they found a lot of the planting strips of wildflowers around your farm attracts the bees and gives them uh, an ability to live there. And it also... Uh, it also helps with the, you don't have to maybe use as much pesticides because things like if you plant, like for example, some, um, what's it, uh, dill. If you plant dill, it'll attract these little wasps, these little tiny wasps, and they lay their larvae in caterpillars. So they c control the caterpillar population. And so they, so the kind of cool that the, uh, you can figure things out, let mother nature help you with mother nature. Um, so a little bit more about bees. So honey, uh, Possibly the world's oldest fermented beverage is a honey wine or mead. You probably heard of meads. If you put yeast and honey in water, you can ferment it. But um, <clears throat> and he, honey is actually used to treat wounds, and that's from a long time ago. People would use honey for for wound treatment, and they do actually have uh, the last I checked, they have one FDA approved use of this one honey. So there's this bees that live in Minnesota, and they get their pollen from a certain flower out there, and then their honey, it, it's used to treat wounds. So sometimes they'll have someone with a bacterial infection that's not healing up with the normal antibiotics, and they use this honey and it works. Or at least it's another tool, it's pretty interesting. And then because of its composition, honey, it can last a long time. It almost has no expiration date because it's kind of thick and, and it's got these acids and uh, other things in it that help protect it. It's pretty interesting. And then they found a preserved objects in honey because it can preserve things. Uh, so where do we get our honey? Uh, like when you buy honey at the store, uh, this is 2018 numbers, mostly in China. 446.9 million tons 
So times that by 2,000 pounds, that's a lot, huh? I, mean, I guess Turkey makes a lot. Iran, the, the Ukraine, and the U.S. Pretty cool, huh? And uh, <clears throat> I was looking up what is in honey. Well, I knew fructose was in there. It's got a lot of fructose um, honey. And there's, they did it on this Wikipedia site. It talked about an NMR study. So I caught my eye. So they were using NMR to figure out the, the percentage of fructose and glucose in honey. And this was like they were looking at hundreds of different honeys. So pretty interesting. So that's why it's a wide range there. A lot of fructose and glucose. So remember glucose, you can draw it as a Fisher projection. And uh, this is the six carbons, right, glucose has. And it has one, two, three, four stereocenters, aldehyde on top. And uh, is this glucose an alpha, or is it a D glucose, or is it L glucose? Well, if you look over here, the lowest alcohol, the alcohol further from the aldehyde is uh, on the right side, so that's a, a D glucose. And you, we call it D because it can be built up from D glyceraldehyde. So if this aldehyde was right here at carbon four, it was just a three carbon sugar, that would be D glyceraldehyde. And that's where D glucose name comes from. And the D glucose will cyclize into a six membered ring like this, right? And um, when it does this, let's try to see how that would happen. So carbon one, it's the same numbers, they're different colors. Carbon one, two, three, four, and I gotta make a, a six-membered ring, right? A cyclo, like a cyclohexane type of ring. So if I go one, two, three, four, five, I have to go to this oxygen would be the sixth member of the ring. So this oxygen adds to that aldehyde, and that makes a one, two, three, four, five, six-membered ring. And when it adds that aldehyde, it can add from our side of the screen or from the back side. So it creates a new stereocenter there, and uh, that's what this is here. So this alcohol could be, this, this, this oxygen here, that's the green alcohol. That can be facing down or up. When it's down like this, it's, it's in the opposite direction of the primary alcohol. This is the, the primary alcohol in the sugar. So it's got a primary alcohol. That's a secondary, secondary, secondary. So when it's, when it's facing the opposite way of the primary alcohol, what do we call it? The alpha sugar. So that one stereocenter, when it's down, it's alpha. If the stereocenter is such that the alcohol is up, it's the beta sugar we refer to it. And the beta, the way I remember it, is when the alcohol is up the same way as the primary alcohol, then these both B or beta up, you know, B for beta. And uh, so this is alpha D glucose D because it came from this glucopyranose. Pyranose refers to the six atom ring. So it's some interesting stuff, right? And uh, fructose also, uh, honey's got a lot of fructose. Um, so fructose is not an aldehyde like glucose. It's a ketone, but it's also a six carbon sugar. One, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, this is D glu D. Uh, I was going to ask you. <laughs> this is D fructose, right? Because the alcohol is on the right there. This could be made from D glyceraldehyde, and this will cyclize as well. But it prefers most often to cyclize as a five-membered ring instead of a six-membered ring like like glucose, and. Uh, Let's try to figure out where that would happen. So if I start with the carbonyl carbon, that's the thing that's going to be attacked by an alcohol. So it's got to be five atoms away. One, two, three, four, five. It's this alcohol. This alcohol will add to the ketone, and it creates a new stereocenter there. And uh, when it does it, um, this is the new stereocenter right here. Because this is this oxygen is that oxygen. That's the one that made the ring, came around, boop. So uh, when it creates this new stereocenter right here, this guy, um, it is, what do you think it is, alpha or beta? It's pointing up, and the primary alcohol, not this one, I know it's so confusing, huh? the one that's not attached to the same carbon, but this one is similar to this one. So this primary alcohol, it's pointing up, the alcohol's up, so this is beta, they both be up, beta D fructofuranose. See how the six-membered ring is a purinose and the five-membered ring is a furanose. So interesting stuff you hear about probably and now I get a little bit discussion about why. So um, oh the other thing I was going to say is these carbons right here they have two oxygens attached to them so that should be look familiar. It's like an acetal right but they're not acetals because one of the oxygen has a carbon the other oxygen has hydrogen. So it's not quite a full acetal because an acetal would have, have to have a 
carbon over here. So we actually refer to it as a hemiacetal. It's like half acetal because it has an alkoxy and an alcohol. So this one here as well is a hemiacetal, has an alkoxy and an oxygen alcohol. All right, so guess what? Katrine is a YouTube superstar. I shared her video with you guys, and she's up to 47 views already. She's passing up my lecture. We gotta start watching that lecture more. This is actually a, a, a this was a, a changed lecture though, so that's not the true lecture numbers. The old lecture version I took down, but it had views as well. Um, but so the clips are coming in, and it's so fun to watch everybody's clips for the retro synthesis. I, I can't wait to share it with everybody. I'll be working on that this week as well as the, oh, the lab exam. I haven't finished grading the lab exam. I started, but I uh, had to get my lecture up first. Um, oh, and I got a nice letter from a former student, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. Kind of a humble brag, but no, I think it's good for you guys to see that you, where you could be. So my old student, RJ, he was a character. He, uh, he had the class about 10 years. I think it was like eight years ago, 2012. And uh, he's doing well. He's in Arizona, and he... He's got, uh, what does it say, pharmaceutical chemistry, I thought he said, sorry, University of Arizona this year with the intent. So he's in medical school. He graduated, for, graduating from medical school. So people just like you can be doctors if you want to do that. And uh, today is the 27th. Uh, we're not doing the labs, and we're not quite to chapter 23, but we're catching up. And uh, we, yeah, let's just get going. Uh, I got some retros that I did in the last office hour. I did it with um, Sarah, came on to the Zoom session, and there were some really good retros there. So if you want to practice the uh, retros with um, aldol condensation involved, that new reaction we just learned, here's, uh, here's the link for it. It's in the normal office hour area. Here's a little screenshot of part of it. Uh, so you can check out those Google Slides and try practicing them and look at the lecture, um, the actual video of it if you need more explanation. And, oh, we have a, v, a virtual SOTW. The new SOTW this week currently works as a dental assistant, assistant at a pediatrics office. It used to be a certified nursing assistant, which was an interesting job to say the very least. <laughs> and then uh, it's going to be an oral surgeon has has swam with manatees, best life experiment experience. Uh, has three baby has has held three baby alligators, and will be receiving fourth degree at the end of the semester. That's cool. It seems like a lot of you at Sierra can get a lot of degrees. It's kind of fun. And then she loves flying air, real airplanes. Being a co-pilot for her dad and wants to get her own pilot license soon. So that's pretty awesome. You're gonna, that's a little bit of a uh, foreshadowing for you guys. And uh, has worked as a girls summer camp counselor for three summers, transferring to Davis as a biochem biology major, may now, uh, maybe now online <laughs> in the fall. Uh, having, has four nephews, two older half sisters, who she adores and a full little sister who she loves. That is fourth grade, oh, she's a fourth grader. Well, I'm home, and she's homeschooling her now due to coronavirus. <laughs> There'll be there's a family picture later. Never owned any pets. Got a little sister instead. That's what her parents told her. Uh, I have a, I played piano. She played piano since she was three years old. Went to boarding school on the beach, for high school in Monterey. That sounds pretty awesome. And they were the mighty cypress. They were named after the trees. And then uh, loves working puzzles. This passion started post quarantine time, and uh, hates tomatoes and nuts and dessert, and is with the world's biggest passion to the point where they make me sick. Oh, don't don't eat those. Huh? And loves snow skiing, hiking, wakeboarding, and hammocking. So who's the virtual SOTW? Here she is doing a uh, procedure for a medical free medical clinic. Might not know who it is. Here's she's one of these ones. Who's that? Right here, can you tell who it is? And then here's a family picture. And not there, not there, but here. She looks different there, you might not notice who she is there. Here it is, Megan Holbert. So let's all give a nice Sierra College warm round of applause. And uh, here's her and her dad flying the plane, isn't that awesome? 
Okay, so now I want to talk to you about Sir Robert Robertson. Robinson. Robinson, sorry. So this uh, chemist, he was, in, he was knighted because he was so good at slaying organic chemistry problems. He, uh, he synthesized tropion, tropionone in a very quick and efficient way, like a, with, uh, which I'll show you late, uh, shortly, which, is, which mu was much quicker than the old way of doing it. It was, pretty, it was kind of revolutionary when he came up with the synthesis. And uh, tropion tropionone is an alkaloid. You may have heard of an alkalo alkaloid before. An alkaloid is an organic compound with a, a basic nitrogen atom. So this nitrogen it has a lone pair. It's, it's not a super strong base, but it's, it's a medium base. It's got some basicity to it. And there's a lot of important or, uh, biological molecules with these kind of basic nitrogens. And they're called alkaloids. Um, cocaine is another alkaloid. And you can see it's very similar, huh? It's got that same, uh, like this seven-membered. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven-membered ring with a bridged nitrogen there. So you can see cocaine has that same tropionone um, core structure. So that's, it's got some biological activity. That's why it's an important synthesis. Um, so here was a, a one. I think this might have been the first synthesis or one of the first synthesis of tropionone. Here it is. Uh, and it was, uh, it took, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 15 steps. And uh, it had an overall yield of only 0.75%. <laughs> And that's because, you know, this yield might be 80% and that's 90%, but when you multiply this all together, it goes down. And you can see some of the stuff we've learned about, huh? They did, uh, oh, this is interesting. It looks like they add bromine. It probably, hmm, maybe they're, they're abbreviating it. This might have been NBS, and then quinoline would be the base. Do a little E2. And got a lot of HBR. And pretty interesting, huh? So that was the old synthesis. So that was in two, 1901. And then along comes Sir Robinson, and he does the entire synthesis like this, one pot synthesis. One pot synthesis means that you add all these chemicals together, heat them up, and then do your workup. You don't have to like stop, uh, take it out of the reaction flask, purify it, add it to another reaction flask or pot. So it's a pretty incredible one step versus the previous one, which was like, I forget how many steps. So he did it in one step, and he uh, it's it's overall 17% yield, which is way higher than 0.75. So 70% yield is kind of low, but still much higher. All right, and another thing I want to talk about is I've been saying we remove water from a lot of reactions to help improve their yield. So here um, is one of the cool ways you can remove water from a reaction. This is called a, uh, uh, shoot, I'm forgetting the name of this. Dean Stark trap. That's what this one is. This is it right here is a Dean Stark trap. The way this will work is say you're running a reaction and you use toluene as a solvent and as the reaction proceeds it makes water. So you have toluene, this is in the reaction flask, and then water gets formed. When the water gets formed, formed, if you boil this reaction, what happens is the water and the toluene start, the vapor of the two come up and it's a weird thing. They form what's called an azeotrope. Azeotropes are... Um, it's really strange. It's two molecules in a gas phase that kind of stick together and then they they distill out of the reaction on their uh, as a pair. Or like in this case, it's actually the azeotrope between water and toluene. It's like 20% water, 80% toluene. So somehow they come up and not only that, their boiling point's low, 84.2 degrees Celsius, this azeotrope. And this azeotrope can travel up here and as it travels up here, it makes its way up to the water condenser, cooled water condenser. And when it gets to the cooled water condenser, the azeotrope gas thing can condense and drip down into here and be collected down there. And when the azeotrope in the gas phase becomes a liquid phase, then your toluene and your water separate out because toluene is not soluble in water. And it's so weird that they somehow form this crazy azeotrope as a gas. And then they, what happens is this thing fills up the toluene will be on top, it'll spill back in. So you constantly get the water removed, but the toluene returned, unless the water filled all the way, th this whole thing up. But you can drain off the water as well. Pretty cool, huh? And you can actually monitor your the progress of your reaction, because let's say you make like one mole of water per mole of your whatever your reaction is, then you can get the volume of the water, it's graduated here. And then once you get to like, um, 
how, whatever volume one mole of water is, then you'll know, oh, the reaction's done. I removed a mole of water. That made, I made a mole of product. It's pretty awesome, huh? Yeah, and so the, and the thing that's really crazy, I think, is water's boiling point's 100 degrees Celsius by itself. Toluene's boiling point's 110 degrees Celsius. But this azeotrope of water toluene, which is 20% water, 80% toluene, has a boiling point below both of them. It's strange. I, I, don't, I don't understand the physics of it, but it's a, something that's used a lot. Chemists use it to uh, you know, remove water from reactions. And also, sometimes you'll actually, if you have a molecule that's hydrated, it has water molecules stuck to it, it's a hydration. If you can't get them off just by putting them under high vacuum, chemists will dissolve them in toluene and then heat them an azeotrope off the uh, water and they'll have this boiling for like overnight just keep letting it get in a little bit more water, a little bit more water each time and then as this Dean Stark trap fills up the toluene spills back in but the water's down below it's pretty cool okay so now I want to talk about the 1-2 and the 1-4 additions that we talked about last time so remember when you add uh, here to this carbon that would be a 1-2 addition and what do we call that carbon the one it's double bonded to the oxygen, carbonyl carbon. So if you add at the carbonyl carbon, that's a 1-2 addition. If you add, or you won't add here, but what's this carbon called? That's the carbonyl carbon. This one is the alpha carbon. And then down here, what's that one? The beta carbon. So you have the carbonyl carbon, the alpha, the beta. All right, so here I have a alpha, and then we call this guy an alpha, or an alpha beta unsaturated ketone because it has unsaturation right there, because those, this carbon atoms aren't saturated with hydrogen, so they're unsaturated. So when you have an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone, nucleophiles might attack the carbonyl carbon, the 1-2 addition, or they might attack the uh, beta carbon, which is the 1-4 addition, which the 1-4, remember, is also called um, conjugate addition, because it's like the alkene is conjugated to the carbonyl, or it could be called Michael addition. So the different nucleophiles add to different places more often. So the lithium, do you guys remember which one that adds to more? The carbonyl carbon, the beta carbon, or both? Let's see. Oh, it mainly adds to the carbonyl carbon. So if you want to add to the carbonyl carbon and you have alpha beta on saturation, you use an organolithium. Uh, what about the Grignard? Which one does that add to? Let's see. It does do the 1-2 addition to the carbonyl, but it also adds 1-4. So the Grignard is like, we oui, oui, I'll, I'll add one, two, I'll add one, four, or whatever we like. We should love life, have some wine, some cheese. You just can rack both ways. So you, lithium, the, the Grignard, you probably just don't even want to use it. Usually you'll add the lithium if you want to add one, two. And then what about, I didn't show you this one, but what do you think about amines? What do you think they would add? They add one, they add to the uh, beta carbon as well, the one, four addition. And then what about an enolate? What if I have an enolate come in here? We'll put a hinge on. Bam, bam. Oh, they do 1 4 addition as well. So it seems like most people do 1 4 addition, huh? And then organocuprates, we saw that last lecture. And yep, it adds 1 4 as well. So lithium's the one that adds 1 2. That's what you'll use it for. Green urines, they add both, so you won't really use it. If you want to add a carbon to the, four, to the beta, if you want to make a carbon addition to this beta carbon, the 1,4 addition, use a cooper. And we're going to see enolates add there. Uh, we won't really do amines, but I just thought I'd throw it in there. And alkyl oxides, they'll add 1,4 too. Most things go 1,4. Okay, so now let's look um, in our mechanism database. There's a, there's a nice Sir Robinson annulation uh, animation I'm going to show you guys. That's one of the new, next reactions we're going to learn. Uh, I just want to show you where it is right now. You're going to see that shortly. So this is the Sir Robinson annulation animation I told you about. This is on our website. You download it. It's a, P it's a PowerPoint. It was made by a former honor student, Afi Afika. And uh, here it is. Uh, we've got our alpha-beta unsaturated ketone, alpha-beta. And then um, we have an aldehyde. Uh, it's not alpha-beta unsaturated. It's, it's saturated alpha-beta. And we're going to add a base, something like sodium ethoxide, or is that what I chose? Yeah, ethanol and heat. And water is going to form. You're going to remove water. If you wanted, you could have, instead of adding ethanol as a solvent, or, yeah, you could add a toluene to azeotrope off the water as it forms. And it makes this uh, six-membered ring with alpha-beta unsaturation. 
and it's all one pot. This is uh, Sir Robinson slaying another reaction. And this mechanism is awesome. So let's, let's pr and then water is formed too and it's produced. So I got an outline for you for the mechanism. First, you make the enolate, this uh, alkoxide, the ethoxide is going to make the enolate. And it's going to make it on the non-alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl. So which carbonyl? This one is going to make the enolate there. And then this enolate is going to do 1,4 addition. It's going to add to the beta carbon. You're going to get some proton transfers, and then you're going to get an intramolecular aldol condensation unit with a dehydration. So uh, let me show you that. Okay, so here's overall reaction shortcut. Oh, yeah, before I do the reaction, actually, I'm going to show you uh, for like synthesis purposes and just getting the overall reaction. If you take your alpha beta unsaturated ketone and you draw the uh, aldehyde or ketone underneath it, that's not unsaturated, and you line this carbonyl up with that alpha carbon like we do in aldol, this is set up now to give you your, your product. See how there's like a bond there and there, and that's what this is? And this just, you can see the aldol happening there, huh? Remember we've done aldols like that with the double bond. You can see the 1,4 addition there. So let's look at the mechanism. So we'll first make the enolate, so that's easy. There we go, we got our enolate. And the enolate does 1,4 addition, we saw that before. It's a strong nucleophile, weak electrophile, alpha beta. So the enolate goes down there, adds to that beta carbon, and uh, I highly suggest you number your carbons in this. It's so easy to get mixed up, but I should have an honor student number these ones. But you can see the addition was this carbon with the red dot is right here. It was to the beta carbon. All right, and now at this point, uh, the you have an enolate, and it can maybe attack the aldehyde. But if this enolate right here attacks that aldehyde across, it would make a one, two, three, four-membered ring, and that's kind of tight. It's hard to make a four-membered ring. Six-membered rings are way more favored, right? So it's the, we have an enolate, but it's not the right enolate. So what happens is you do some proton transfers, or you protonate the alpha carbon, boom, like that, right? Then... Uh, we need to make a six-membered ring, so we need to make the enolate over on this side. So the enolate on this side was wrong, on this side it's good. So we uh, deprotonate that, and we get our enolate there. And then uh, you can see it's going to make a one, two, three, four, five, six-membered ring. And then <clears throat> continuing on the next page, it does like an, basically an aldol condensation. So you add to the, to the aldehyde, get a stereo center there. Then you uh, protonate it, and now this is in the beta position on the other side, huh? alpha, beta. So these are bad leaving groups, but <clears throat> we're going to give some push to get that leaving group off. So I'm going to make the enolate over here like this. And then I don't want this to come off as hydroxide, so I'm going to do like we did with the other aldol. I'm going to have it be protonated on the way off. And then there it is. We made our final product for the Sir Robinson annulation. And this uh, re reaction is like almost it's complete, not totally, but it's, it's got like most of chapter 18 in it. So it's a perfect reaction to have on an exam, and it's a perfect reaction for you guys to learn to do well. So I'm going to make a quiz for it. I think it, it might be Wednesday or Thursday this week. Probably not. Well, we'll see. See if I get around to it. I got to read the lab exam as well. But yeah, I'm going to give you a quiz on this, and this will definitely be on the next exam. So practice it, and once you get this reaction down, it really helps you with most of Chapter 18. All right, so uh, let's work on this Sir Robinson annulation. Um, I showed you an example of the PowerPoint click-through, but seeing it on the board is actually really helpful too, so let's get good at this. So um, when you do the Sir Robinson annulation, you first make an enolate of the non-alpha-beta unsaturated so this is the alpha beta unsaturated ketone. These are also referred to as enones. So this alpha beta unsaturated ketone, aka enone, because it's an alkene, ene, and a ketone ohm, so enone. It needs to be attacked by this aldehyde, but not the aldehyde, but the enolate of the aldehyde. So that's the first thing you have to do uh, in the mechanism, is you take your aldehyde, make it into the enolate. So we have a nice strong base here. Under basic conditions, you uh, have 
negative charge organic intermediates. So this is looking good. Uh, we're going to deprotonate the alpha carbon to make our enolate. And remember that alpha carbon is fairly acidic for carbon because it has resonance. And I just skipped to the major resonance structure. But the pKa of this guy is 19. It's pretty sick. And then uh, after I've made my enolate, this is a strong nucleophile. It's going to add to the alpha beta unsaturated ketone, aka okay, you know, and it's going to add in a way that it uh, it's going to add one four. Most things add one four. One thing that likes to add mainly one two is the organolithiums. Okay, so it's going to add there, and I think it'll be best to number this. Let's number it like this. Uh, this is going to maybe seem weird, but you'll see at the end why I'm doing it. One two. Three, four, five, six. We'll number it like that. <clears throat> and um, you could number it however you want. I just numbered it this way. So what's going to happen is they're going to drop down our lone pair. It's going to hinge on carbon four, and that's going to come add to carbon one. Ugh, got kind of ugly there. Sorry. All right, there we go. And. Um, no, that's not where it's going to add. Dumb. Sorry, I just said it was going to add one more. Okay. Do, 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 do. All right, so here we go. It's going to add one four. It's going to add down here to carbon five. And then we're going to have a hinge on carbon six, which is going to swing up to the carbonyl. Put the minus charge on the oxygen. That's a major resonance structure. So a strong nucleophile can do that even with a weak electrophile like this one. And that will give us. Following. I'm drawing this a certain way so you can kind of see what's going on a little better. So I decided to number this one was one, right? And then it was two. And then I said this was three. Four, five, six, right? So off of carbon four, I have that wiggly methyl. And then off of carbon five, I should have a methyl as well, huh? And that will also be wiggle. Because the enolate can come from our side of the board or the other side of the board. All right, so we're looking good here. And at this point, we, we know uh, we need to make a six member ring. But we. Um, are we up? Are we ready to make a six-member ring? We have the strong nucleophile and the weak electrophile, but will it currently make a six-member ring? Let's see. If I drop that lone pair down, hinging on six, if I reached over there, that would make a one, two, three, four. That would just make a four-atom ring. So right now, it's not ready to make the six-member ring. I need to get the enolate not on this right-hand side, but on the left-hand side, because if it's over here on carbon two, then it can add the three, and it makes a six-member ring. So we just gotta do some proton transfers. And our solvent is ethanol, so that'll be our proton transfer. We'll protonate carbon six. Hinging on six, goes over there. And we get the following. So now uh, we don't have the enolate, <clears throat> but we'll have to make it again over on carbon two. I'll remember this too to make sure we're doing it right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, and now carbon two, it's uh, fairly acidic as well. Ketones, pKa's are about 20. And you might wonder, like, oh, why not just put to protonate there? PK is 19 there. Well, you can deprotonate there, but it doesn't lead to your product. That would give a 
one, two, three, four atom ring again. So this reaction is in equilibrium, so things like deprotonating here can happen and come back and forth and back. But if it gets to the point where water comes off and you remove the water, that get, everything gets pulled that direction. So here we go, we're gonna deprotonate carbon two. Make our CLA. Once again, a negative charge organic intermediate. And we're all set up now to do our basically aldol condensation, intermolecular. Drop this bond down, have this swing open there. That go there. We formed a six membered ring. go and uh, we just continue on with uh, on the I'm gonna do it on the next board so then uh, we need to protonate that alpha oxide because that alpha oxide is gonna become the alcohol that's gonna leave but it's not a great leaving group well, we know how to deal with that. Protonate the alcohol or the alpha oxide, like so. And now. This isn't a good leaving group, it's a bad leaving group, right? The alcohols. But it's got to come off, so how are we going to do it? We're going to give it some push. We're going to make the enolate over on the left hand side. The enolate could form over here, but it can go back and forth. But when it forms here, then it's ready to push off the uh, bad leaving group. So here we go. I make the enolate there. And uh, like I've done before, I want this guy to leave, but I don't want it to leave as a strong base hydroxide. So I'm gonna have it protein in on the way out. Hinge here at the alpha carbon, swing down to make the alpha beta on saturation. Have this come off. Be protonated as it does to make my final product. There you go, there you go. In the water you remove, and that will help you yield a lot. Because this is a, it's a thermodynamic control. Alpha, beta, unsaturated ketones like this, a cyclic enone, they're pretty stable because they have conjugation. And uh, when the water is taken away, then even if these equilibriums aren't very favorable, they all get just yanked this way. And we can remove that water by a number of ways. One of them we just learned today, you can have this reaction if you wanted. Throw some toluene in there, and then azeotrope off the water. Um, yeah. uh, this is the Sir Robinson annulation. And this one's awesome. It, uh, it does so much <clears throat> in just one pot. You just throw these two molecules together and just reflux them for a while. Boom, you got this nice enone product. So Sir Robinson slayed another organic chemistry reaction. In my opinion, the key to chapter 18 is the Sir Robinson animation. If you know this one, you could slay this one, then you'll be knighted and the rest of it should come a lot easier. 
So that's why I'm making a big deal about it and having us practice it a lot. And I want you guys to practice it, and it's pretty cool. Once you practice it a little bit, it's, I know it's a long mechanism, a lot going on, but you're gonna get it. And my former students did great on this material. On exams, I usually get like you know, 95% when I give them this type of a overall reaction and the mechanism. So I want you to practice the mechanism, but I also want you to just be able to write up the overall product quickly without having to draw out the entire mechanism, even though you'll be asked to do both. But So here's a, a trick you can use. You draw up your alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And I like to draw it up with my alpha beta unsaturation on the right, like this, right? And then I draw my aldehyde under the other alpha carbon that's not unsaturated. Like that. So I'm setting this up like a aldol condensation, because you know aldol condensation is part of this synthesis, right? And, um, <clears throat> and then I'm setting up this alpha carbon to do the conjugate addition there. So you can see my six-membered ring that's going to form. One, two, three, four, five, six. So in order to draw the product of this, it's easy. You just draw out your six-membered ring with the carbonyl on top. It's carbon one. And then where the aldehyde is placed, that's your double bond now, like we do with aldols. And now let's number around. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So now I just gotta make sure to add on the methyls, ethyls, whatever's on the outside. So carbon two has a methyl off of it, so I gotta add that methyl there. Carbon three just has the hydrogen from the aldehydes. I don't have to show that. Four is gonna have a methyl, and that's gonna be wiggled. Five's uh, just hydrogen, six has a methyl as well. So there it is, I can quickly draw my overall product. Um, and if you set it up this way, boom, you got it, right? But I also, I want you to know the mechanism of all, uh, uh, mechanism as well. So let me just do a verbal mechanism real quick. So what's gonna happen first? First, you make the enolate at carbon four. So that becomes an enolate. And then you have one four addition. So this enolate adds to the carbon five. And then you get, a, you get an enolate then it's in the wrong position because it'll only make a four-membered ring. You have to protonate that enolate, deep, make the other enolate. So you gotta do some proton transfers. So you do your proton transfers, you get your enolate at carbon two, and then it's set up to do just alcohol condensation. So I really like setting it up like this because you can just see the whole mechanism laid out for me. If you're not understanding this and following along, just do the mechanism, get good at it. All right, let's try another one. So I've got this one set up. So actually you should pause the video maybe and try to do this one and then come back and watch me do it. So welcome back. Here we go, I've got my alpha beta unsaturated ketone, my enone. And I'm going to put that aldehyde underneath here, like so. Oh, I didn't draw that right. Put that aldehyde right underneath there. And uh, it's got like a one, two, three, four, five carbon chain. One, two, three, four, five carbon chain. And then there's a torpedo at the end. I'm going to double check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, looks good. So if I draw it up like that, then I will see, oh yeah, I'm gonna make my, that's the aldol, this is the one, four addition side. So my product's gonna look like this. So I've got my six member ring, and here let's number it so we can make sure we don't make a mistake. Let's go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, what do we need? Carbon two is good, three is good, four has got this coming off of it. Let me make sure I didn't mess up the carbons. 
number of carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looking good. Carbon five's got two methyls off of it. That's interesting how huh? we haven't seen that yet. Six, it's all good. So that's our product. Pretty quick and easy, huh? And uh, once you get good at going the forward way, I want you to do the retro too. So let me show you this first one and then I'll have you practice that one. So the retro, uh, it's actually, I think, easier than doing the forward way. So in the retro, you're gonna disconnect between two and three. That's the aldol condensation. And then you're also gonna disconnect between five and four. That's the conjugate addition side. So my retro for this will be the following. So let's number it, make sure I did it right. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go, yeah, looks good. I got a methyl off of four. I've got the isopropyl off of six, a methyl off of two. Not too bad, huh? Um, and then, oh, I was gonna, I forgot to mention this before. I think it's interesting how the, the pi bond switches sides. Like I have an alpha, beta, unsaturated on the right-hand side of the, the way I've set this up. And then in the product, it's on not between five and six anymore. It's over here, switched over. Something that helps me see it. So now why don't you try that one, pause the video, come back and I'll show you. Okay, welcome back. So here we go. I can disconnect here between carbon two and three. And then I got four, five, six. And then between five and four too, that's where the aldehyde comes in to do a conjugate addition. And then this alkene could be E or Z. It doesn't matter. I'll make it work. I'll say it's a mixture. It doesn't matter. So then I have my aldehyde down below. And that's it, huh? So yeah, off of six, I got a methyl. Five, I've got a methyl. And that's it. Um, so now that I've given you these practices, practice examples, you can make up as many as you want, really. You can make up your own. And what you could do is you could try doing the mechanism. So, you know, do this mechanism, do this mechanism. And after you've done a couple of them, it should be easy. And it's pretty amazing that it is easy because this stuff is, is crazy. Sir Robinson was knighted because of it. He had the sword and the queen said, you have made, you've slayed organic chemistry. <laughs> All right, now we have a retro synthesis. So to finish off chapter 18, of course, we got to get a retro in there. And this one's awesome. It's got just acetone. Got your acetone score bottle. We're going to make this big monster here. It's got a six-membered ring, so that should be making you think Sir Robinson annulation. Um, but it doesn't have the unsaturation. But then maybe the unsaturation was on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side. Uh, the way I worked it out, I want to add on one, one, two, three carbons. That's kind of weak. One, two, three, because I know I have three carbon fragments. If I work on this side, it would be a one carbon thing. I'll show you what I mean. So I'm going to imagine a disconnection here. Oh, and I had the double bond there because I did a, a conjugate addition or one four addition or Michael addition. Okay, so let's do the retro. So I got my six-membered ring. And after you see the first step, I hope it really gets you on the right track to understanding what I'm talking about. I'm going to disconnect right here. Cut off that three-carbon unit. And that can come from the enone. And how would I add a carbon 1,4 with the cuprate? So I'm using our new organometallic, the organocuprate. And that can add to the 4 position there. And now when I look at this, I think, okay, this is what Robinson annulations uh, retros are like. We've done these. So I can disconnect here between what I was calling carbons 2 and 3, 4, 5, 6. And I want to disconnect between 
four and five as well. So let me grab my chair. Got my alpha beta and saturated ketone. Draw my aldehyde underneath that alpha carbon. As we always do for aldols. One, two, three, four, five, six. Looking good, right? And then this one, we know how to do this. This is just an aldol. Disconnect there. And that is uh, what we want to start with. So we're already done with that part. The aldehyde, you know you can make that from an alcohol. And the alcohol can come from a lot of things, and it can, uh, one of them being the alkene, right? You can get that from anti markovnikov hydration of an alkene. The alkene can come from our other alcohol, internal, the secondary alcohol, right? Which you can see comes from the acetone. There we go, we got that part solved, but we still haven't uh, finished off the squeezing in this I think what we still haven't made our cuprate yet but we know how to do those those cuprates come from the lithium the organolithium and the copper one iodide cuprous iodide and then the lithium can come from the bromide of course and the bromide can come from the alcohol huh so there we go we got our retro let's do our synthesis <clears throat> I'm gonna make the cuprate first. Why not? So I take my acetone. I'll reduce it. Uh, I'll go with sodium borohydride. Why not? I could use lithium aluminum hydride as well. And uh, get my alcohol. All right, and I'm gonna make this into the bromide. How can I do that? I can use PBR3 or HBR. I'll use HBR, why not? And then I need to make this into the organolithium. Add some lithium metal, diethyl ether, THF, ether is fine. And then I add the copper one iodide in uh, diethyl ether as well. I make my cuprate. And the cuprates, a lot of students get confused. There's no lone pairs on the co copper. It's got a negative charge though, and then the lithium is the plus charge counter ion. Okay, so I got my cuprate, let's pause there. And then I need to make the let's make the aldehyde next. Yeah, let's do that. So I'll take the alcohol that I made up here, I'll dehydrate it. Phosphoric acid, heat, remove water, make the alkene, and now I want to put that alcohol anti monokovnikov so I do hydroboration. BH3. THF, step B, hydrogen peroxide, sodium hydroxide. I have my primary alcohol, which then I treat with a PCC methylene chloride. This way it can uh, stop at the aldehyde, give me my aldehyde I want. I'll draw it up the way I have it over there too, to make it easier to see. Okay, so then I'll pause there. So I got those two parts. I got my cuprate, I got my aldehyde. I need to make my alpha beta unsaturated uh, ketone there, my enone. 
Let's do that. That's easy. That's just straight aldol condensation. Uh, let's go like sodium ethoxide, ethanol, heat minus water. Make my enone. Remember, you can come up with that product by drawing the ketone right underneath there. And now I'm going to add on my aldehyde. Oh, my aldehyde was not an aldehyde, sorry. There's an H there. So I'll add in my aldehyde. And uh, a base, I can use the sodium ethoxide again too. Ethanol, heat, minus H2O, same reaction conditions. But in this one, I'm going to get my enone in a six member ring. I imagine that aldehyde underneath here. I get two methyls there, and I'll have a wiggle here. This is carbons. You could draw this out, like move it over if you're if I'm doing it too fast for you. Three, four, five, six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. And this guy uh, should have a carbon four methyl, yes. Of a carbon five, two methyls, yes, looks good. And now we just need to add our cuprate, and then that's the final product actually. So we add one A, our cuprate, which you can abbreviate this way if you like. Fancy, fancy, right? What do you think? We've got two isopropyl groups. And then B, I'm gonna do an acidic workup. I had diethylate, there's a solvent too. And there we go, it adds to the beta carbon, the acid protonates the enolate that's formed. Boom, boom. Two methyls here, one methyl there. And we got it. So pretty awesome, huh? We've got aldol condensation, beta addition, uh, so Robinson annulation, everything, how huh? we slayed it. <laughs> so practice that, you can get good. Feel, feel good when you figure this out too, this stuff's awesome. Back to the outcome, so we're starting chapter 19, carboxylic acids. The uh, carboxylic acids, they're pretty easy to name according to the IUPAC rules. You just take the E part of the alkane and you make it into oic acid. So instead of an alkane, you have an alkanoic acid. So <clears throat> an example of that one is butane here, this bastard butane. If it's, if it's an acid, then it's going to be called butanoic acid. So the E becomes oic acid. And uh, this one, you don't have to say it's one butanoic acid because the carboxylic acid has to be at the end of a chain because the carbon has you know, three bonds to oxygen. It only has one left to be in a chain. So, so that's the way that works. And then uh, the, oh yeah, there's no, nomenclature functional group prioritization. So this isn't something like governed by nature. This is just chemists came up with this. So I'm not like trying to make you, you don't have to like worry about memorizing this completely. I'm going to be pretty easy with you on it. I would like you to know carboxylic acids are the highest priority. So if you have a molecule with a carboxylic acid and uh, like uh, alcohol, it's named as a carboxylic acid, not an alcohol. And so let's look at some examples. <clears throat> so um, this one here, see how it's got a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. So how do we name it? Oh, let's name it as the acid, not the alcohol. It's a higher priority. You'll see too, almost all the higher priorities are carbonyls. If I, if I give you a molecule with two functional groups, which I might, I would give you a carbonyl, probably a carboxylic acid, and then something like this or a bromide or something. So let's name this one. So if we number from here, one, two, three, four, five. So this is going to be not pentane, but pentanoic acid, pentanoic acid. And at carbon two, we have the hydroxyl, hydroxy. So uh, let's see if this is R as well. A, B, C, and the H is D back. So yeah, it's clockwise R. So this is a 2R2 hydroxy pentanoic acid. So I think I'll probably put a carboxylic acid nomenclature on the next exam, or did we have ketones last exam? I forget. And then uh, now, this is something interesting. You already know a lot of this uh, spectroscopy stuff, but maybe you didn't know why. So 
Carboxylic acids are easy to identify in a proton NMR because their acidic hydrogen shows up about 12 parts per million. And one explanation for that is that they dimerize acids and they form this eight-membered ring where this hydrogen is hydrogen bonding to the carbonyl and that one's hydrogen bonding to the other one. So you can see why this carbon gets so de-shielded down to 12 parts per million because it has it's attached to an oxygen that has another oxygen which is resonating, pulling electrons away. And then also it's a hydrogen bonding to that guy. So it's got like kind of like three oxygens pulling on it to de-shield it all the way down to 12 parts per million. And then um, you know too for the carbon NMR, the carbonyl shows up at about 180, 175 parts per million because it's got resonance into it. It's not a ketone or aldehyde, which is all the way down to like 200. And then the IR spectrum, you guys are good with this. The IR has got the strong carbonyl signal. And then the OH is a big mess. It just pukes bleh, all over the, that region. And then uh, I'll pick it up from here on the whiteboard. So chapter 19, acids. Um, you notice how I just say acids, not carboxylic acids? That's because this carboxylic acid is like the main acid of organic chemistry. So you can just abbreviate it called acids as well, even though we've seen all kinds of acids, right? Um, let me uh, show you something about outcome five, I think it was. <clears throat> yeah, the pKa traits. So this is a review. You know if you have uh, acetic acid or a carboxylic acid, you should predict the pKa to be about five. So the pKa of acetic acid in water, 4.74, about five. What happens if you add a electron withdrawing group like say three fluorines to this? This is a, actually a common acid, trifluoral acetic acid, TFA. Trifluoral acetic acid. So what, what should the pKa be? Should it be lower or higher? Should it be a stronger acid, a weaker acid? Turns out the pKa is zero. I like that one that it's right at zero. Not a negative one, but not it's much stronger than regular acetic acid. So why is that? It's you can think of it two ways. Remember, before the acid reacts, the fluorines are very electron withdrawing. They're withdrawing electrons through spawns and space by induction. As they withdraw electron density from that OH bond, it weakens it, makes it more reactive, stronger acid. Also, once this is deprotonated, the negative charge is stabilized by the fluorines because they can draw some of that negative charge to them to help out. All right, and then um, outcome six is uh, define acid derivatives. So here's what an acid derivative is. We're going to see a lot of these. Derivative. So acid derivatives, they're made from acids usually, or you can make them from acids. So an example of an acid derivative is uh, acid chloride. We've been using those, right, for friedel crack So instead of an OH, you have a chloride there. There's an acid chloride. Or there's another one we're gonna see uh, more of is the anhydride. The anhydride, so we have an acid chloride we replace the OH with a chloride. In the anhydride case, you replace the OH with another acetate. Um, so uh, why do we call that an anhydride, actually? Uh, we're going to learn this reaction shortly, but might as well show you real quick. If you take a carboxylic acid, like acetic acid, and you heat it up just by itself, and you remove water, it dehydrates it and it makes the anhydride. So anhydride, like anhydrous, it's, a, it's been dehydrated. Water comes out. It's two acetic acids. We'll look at that mechanism in more detail, but just letting you know about the name. <clears throat> All right, so now outcome seven is we're gonna learn some new reactions. Well, no. We're going to learn one new reaction. Outcome 7, it's, it's a synthesis of carboxylic acids, some ways to make acids. We already know two out of these three. 
So this is uh, acid synthesis. So the first one uh, in outcome seven is the, uh, is it the green here? It's the, oh, oxidation actually. So if you take a primary alcohol, we already know about this, and you do Jones oxidation, chromate, and the key thing is uh, you add sulfuric acid, but the subtle thing that makes all the difference is that this is aqueous. The water is the key. And then a lot of times acetone is in there too. That's to help if this is not very water soluble. It makes it more water soluble. So the water, the white, the reason why that's important is because remember we first it actually first oxidizes it to the aldehyde, which is in equilibrium with the hydrate because water is present. Then that hydrate oxidizes it fully to the carboxylic acid. So that's that's one way to make carboxylic acid. One you've been doing since last year. Uh, another way you can do it is uh, one that you actually did in lab, is you can have a Grignard, say something like this, and you just have this on the lab exam, so this should be pretty easy for you. You take a Grignard and you react that with carbon dioxide. Dry ice works. Uh, say we did ours with diet ether, you use that, THF, and then you do an acidic workup. And this will create your carboxylic acid. And you should know. So if you read the outcomes, you'll see I want you to know this overall reaction only. I say I won't test you on the mechanism. We do have that mechanism in the mechanism database if you want to look at it. Uh, for this one, though, I want you to know the mechanism, but I think you already know it. It was just on the lab exam. So Grignard just adds to the CO2, get a carboxylate. All right, now this last one's pretty cool. This one is a, a nitrile, nitrile hydration. This is a new one. And for this one, I want you to know the overall reaction and the mechanism. Let me actually start this one off at, the, at an alkane. I'll show you like a synthesis. So let's say we take propane. We add bromine and light. Major product will be the secondary bromide. Nothing new there. And then I'm going to do an SN2. And I'm going to do it with sodium cyanide. Cyanide is a great nucleophile. And it's actually poisonous. Uh, you probably see in movies where like a... Uh, a spy is caught behind them, enemy lines, and he kills himself by taking a cyanide tablet. That's what we're dealing with there. Um, so maybe DMSO, polar aprotic solvent, and we'll make our cyanide. I mean, I'm sorry. We use cyanide and we make what's called a nitrile. Okay, so you get your nitrile. So nothing new so far, just radical halogenation of an alkane, SN2. Now the new step is to hydrate this nitrile. You hydrate it just like you would think. Uh, you add water and acid. You can add sulfuric acid. See how it is. Yeah. And so get a carboxylic acid. You also wind up with uh, ammonium. And we'll do the mechanism to see why. Uh, you'll notice on these guys, something special is going on. In method A, we made a primary alcohol into an acid. When we did that, did we gain any carbons or lose any carbons? We didn't gain any carbons, same number of carbons. In method B, we started with this Grignard, one, two, three, four, and our product has one, two, three, four, five carbons. So this one gets a fifth carbon from the uh, dry ice. So method B adds a carbon. 
method A, no carbon addition. I'm, kind of, I'm setting you up for uh, future retros and thinking about how this stuff works. What about in step C? Does that add a carbon? If you're thinking of it from this perspective, yeah, it added a carbon right there, huh? So you wind up, um, if you have a synthesis where you need to add a carbon and make an acid, you can do it with the nitrile synthesis. So uh, let's do the mechanism now. The mechanism is pretty cool. It's a good review for you uh, of the stuff from chapter 17. You'll see those same principles again of um, like the papad p mechanism. It looks a lot like that. But the key idea is to think of a nitrile. I got to dry this so it'll be funky. Think of a nitrile as if it is a carbonyl. It's kind of like a carbonyl. So you know how you have a, let's say this nitrile looks like this. See how you've got a pi bonded carbon pi bonded to an electronegative atom? It's similar to if you have a, like a ketone, say, a carbon pi bonded to an electronegative atom. They're very similar. Of course, the ketone has two lone pairs in the oxygen, the nitrogen only has one. We'll see how this all works out. Okay, so let's do our mechanism. We'll start off by, since we have water and sulfuric acid, we know that the water is going to be protonated by the sulfuric acid. And I'm abbreviating, I abbreviated my sulfuric acid, but I did it correctly, shown all my bonds that are going to break, and, and I'm not uh, skimping on the showing it, the results of each step. You'll see. Got my hydronium and my hydrogen sulfate. Now this nitrile, is, I said it's like a carbonyl. Is a carbonyl a strong or a weak electrophile? It's a weak electrophile, right? So what do you think? What do you think that's going to be? It's going to be a weak electrophile too. So it can be attacked by strong nucleophiles, just like a carbonyl can be attacked by strong nucleophiles. We're under acidic conditions. Does it seem like we're going to have strong nucleophiles? In this one, no. You could, in some cases, you could have strong nucleophiles with acidic conditions, say with like a hydrobromic acid, because that's a strong acid, but the bromide is a strong nucleophile. But here, water is our nucleophile. It's a weak one. So we're not going to get anything to happen until we make our electrophile strong. So we're going to take and we're going to. Oh, yeah, we could spell stuff out with this too, huh? We're going to take first though. Oh, what am I doing? I always won't put that nitrogen on first for some reason. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to protonate. We protonated once, we're going to protonate again. Protonate the nitrile. Like so. We got a puff puff. And now we went from a weak electrophile to a strong electrophile. You see how that's a strong electrophile because the carbon now has a nitrogen above it with a positive charge. That's really pulling on it to make it much more positive. And so even uh, a weak nucleophile like water can react. And it's reacting just like we react with carbonyl carbons, right? Breaking a pi bond. So we had a p, p, Ah, we add it. Our 
our nitrogen is happy now because it has a, uh, a plus charge. I mean, uh, it no longer has the plus charge, getting the lone pair. And then we're going to uh, deprotonate this guy because if you look at the overall reaction, we want to take this carbon and add oxygens and lose the nitrogen. Huh? So we want to go from having a triple bond to a nitrogen to having no bonds to nitrogen. And instead of being bonded to a nitrogen, you want two oxygens bonded to you. So at this point, is that water molecule, does it look like a good leaving group? Or a bad leaving group? It looks like a good leaving group. So we don't want it to leave. It could, you know, it reverses. But instead of letting it do that, let's deprotonate it so it's not such a good leaving group. And what's our proton shell? Just water. So it deprotonate, so we want to put pad. It's looking similar, right? You're probably already guessing at something like this. I'm going to add some acid, hydronium. And I'm trying to keep my oxygen on there. I deprotonated it, so now it's not a good leaving group. I want to make this guy leave though, huh? So what do we usually do when we want something to leave? We protonate it. So let's protonate that. This should make sense because if you look, I've got, I've got this nitrogen. I want it to have four hydrogens. It's already got two. We went from no hydrogens. Now we got two of the four. And this was the one I was thinking of the net, the resonance for, so I'll draw it here. This is the resonance. You can draw this resonance and see what's going on here. sharing back and forth. Which one do you think is the major resonance structure? They have all octets on everybody. Oxygen, is it, do we want the nitrogen with the plus charge? Or the more electronegative oxygen? I think this one's the major resonance structure. But it's nice to see that that happens. Okay, so now I'm gonna continue this mechanism on the other board. So let me uh, erase, draw it over here. So let's, uh, I'll go ahead and draw that major resonance structure. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so this guy, what does it look like? It, does it look like an electrophile to you? Looks like an electrophile to me, that carbon there, yep. And this is a strong electrophile. It's got the plus charge on the nitrogen. So, and we need to add another oxygen to this molecule, correct? So let's have another water molecule come along, take care of that for us. So the water is going to add into there, which is the nitrile I said is like a carbonyl, right? Uh, this is even looks more like a carbonyl because it's double bond instead of a triple. So we add into there, so we went a pad, and now we're pop, we've added. So we've got two oxygens on that carbon. We need to get two oxygens on there. We already got two. We need to get the nitrogen off. Currently, what's a better leaving group? This oxygen over here or the nitrogen over here? That's the better leaving group. But I want that to stay. So I need to use a proton shuttle to uh, shuttle that over to the nitrogen, right? So now we're going to deprotonate. So we went papad, pad, papad, pad. Is that what we're doing? I'm going to double check that. Deprotonate. And 
it's no, I have it wiggled here. After I deprotonate, I have two alcohols on there, so it's no longer a stereocenter. So I'm not wiggling it. I made the hydronium, which is catalytic in this reaction, so now I can protonate my amine to make it more acidic. I mean, to make it a better leaving group. Did I say deprotonate? For some reason, I, I really like this mechanism. I remember when I was a student, like you guys, and the teacher had us try to work it out. And I was like, oh yeah, it's the same as the other guy. And I was able to just take it step by step, it was fun. Okay, so now that's a good leaving group. So what, what do we do? We kick it off. Push, pull, elimination. push-pull reaction, right? And uh, we're just about there. The amine came off, and uh, the last step will just be to determine it. And you can do this with water, or you can show it with the amine. The amine will get protonated in an acidic solution, you already know that. Like for drug extractions, means get protonated, become more water soluble. And there we have it. We've made a carboxylic acid, and let's see what we spell out. Uh, uh. Put it, put it, add a pad and then protonate, add, deprotonate. So pad, pad, <laughs> A D P E D, pad, yeah, that's it. Pa pad, pad, ped. There you go. Pa pad, pad, ped. You can say it fast a bunch of times. So the nitrile uh, synthesis is a nice one. Good, good, just like reviewing all these concepts we've been learning about mechanisms.